And now, please welcome our moderator, Sandra Cook. Good morning and very much welcome to our webinar. This is the third, uh, third webinar in our series on, on compliance standards for elevators and escalators. And we're also going to be presenting um, an update to the, uh, do the compliance standard for hydraulic contraction elevators. I'm going to be presenting today with AJ and Dean. AJ took over being the statutory director of elevating and museum devices on May 1st. Uh, AJ, if you could um, uh, turn your camera on and um, unmute yourself and just introduce yourself to the audience. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, my name is AJ Kadir Gamar. Uh, I have been with the DSSA for four years. And before taking over this new role, I was the director for shared services and compliance support for three years. And previously, I worked in the elevator industry for 20 years in, uh, in the US, uh, Europe, and in Asia, mostly with uh, Kone and with Otis Elevators. And I'm looking forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's been a couple of questions in the chat. Um, we are recording this webinar and it will be available on our website. So people that cannot attend today, uh, they, can, they can view it. We'll also attach the, uh, the slide deck to it as well. So I'm happy to presenting, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about compliance standards and how we develop them. And also be looking at TSSA's transformation to become an outcome-based regulator. We've also introduced some updates to our compliance standard for hydraulic contraction elevators. We introduced this compliance standard on March 1st, and we did some updates to it on June 12th. So just to talk about our transformation, we've been on about a five-year journey to become an outcome-based regulator. Prior to this, we were very compliance concentric, like we were very much wanted everything to comply completely. We've really readjusted our focus to be beyond harms reduction. So we really want to address high risk uh, non-compliances in entities, right? And so we're trying to use data to make decisions that are evidence-based and balanced. Uh, we want to respond consistently and proportionally to the risk of harm. So we really want to address high risk non-compliances first and foremost, right? We want to be clear and flexible and collaborative and transparent when we regulate. And we do want to partner with you. We see this as a partnership to improve safety in Ontario. And we've really looked at our full regulatory toolkit, which includes authorizations. Authorizations are our license where we license devices and facilities. We uh, certify tradespeople and we register businesses. About two years ago, we introduced what we call a lapsed authorization process. In, in, the, in the past, when somebody let their license lapse, TSSA really took no regulatory action. Uh, about two years ago, we introduced a program, whereas when a license lapse for up to 60 days, we do take action. And if we can't get the people uh, to be licensed by reaching out to them, we will, we will send out inspection. This has resulted in about a 95% success rate, which we're quite proud of. One of the things that we have to recognize about a license is that that is the base of our whole regulatory system. And if, if people are working unlicensed, that's not fair to the people that are licensed. Also, if we don't know where everybody is licensed in the province, we cannot deploy our resources properly. So we see the, the license as a key regulatory tool and we're really emphasizing on that. Inspections, of course, have always been a key regulatory tool for TSSA. We initially inspect something before we put it into operation. Thereafter, we do periodic inspections. Uh, we also do complaint inspections. And also, we, when incidents happen, we deploy our inspectors to investigate those as well. Compliance standards is what we're going to be actually speaking about today. Now, compliance standard is a tool that we use on a periodic inspection. It denotes a high risk non-compliance, and if it's found on a periodic inspection, we will be following up. And I'll go over how we develop compliance standards for both elevators and escalators in, in later slides. We introduced a compliance support program about four years ago, and this is really designed as a voluntary program, which is designed to help the entities that are really struggling with compliance. We reach out to them and offer them support in order to help them bring them into compliance. It is also a free program. We also have education advocacy. Um, at the beginning of the, um, uh, of the summer season, we normally do a barbecue campaign on how to use barbecue safely. And in the fall, we normally have a CO campaign. We do have a fuels program where CO is one of the uh, silent killers in the province. 
And of course, we do have enforcement. When we issue a license, we can't put conditions on that license. We can revoke that license if somebody is a bad player. And if somebody's repeatedly um, um, doing things that are um, non-compliant and consistently do it, we can prosecute them as well. And we do have a prosecution uh, team in place at TSSA. We want to deliver smart, innovative, and responsive services. And we want to reward people that are compliant and deter people that are not. So for example, when we do periodic inspections in elevators and in up for escalators, once the, the devices that are considered high risk are, are inspected on a six month basis periodically, and those are considered low risk uh, are inspected on a five year basis. Next slide, please. So a compliance standard, uh, first of all, what is it? A compliance standard is a list of high risk non-compliances where if they're found on a periodic inspection, TSSA will be following up. Typically they will have a zero day to comply or, or 14 days. Zero day to comply would normally be a shutdown order or 14 days to get that thing corrected. If this helps by understanding what are the high risk to public safety, one of the big things that we really are um, wanting to get out of this is inspector consistency. Um, as a regulator, and, and TSSA is the same as all regulators, one of the big um, complaints about us is that, you know, if I have an inspection done by Sandra, it may look very different than an inspection done by Dean. By having a compliance standard, which where we have checklists built into our computer system where the inspectors have to answer questions and they result in orders, we hope that an inspection that occurs in Ottawa will be the same as an inspection that occurs in Windsor. And I think that is something that um, both our inspectors I look forward to and certainly I think the people that we regulate do too. We want to reduce harm by addressing the non-compliances based on the risk level. So addressing those that pose the highest risk first is, is very much prominent in our mind. We want to have an improved understanding of safety priorities. We developed these uh, compliance standards and they've been posted on our website uh, since January, 2022. So they've been there um, and we have, I know Dean has gone out to industry many times and, and made people aware of them. So we wanna be very transparent and have people understand what we believe and what we have analyzed to be the high risk things that need to be addressed. It helps ensure the safety of employees, contractors, customers and the public by promptly addressing high risk. But also, it also acknowledges that you as a regulated party are responsible for full compliance of your device at all times. The TSSA uh, periodic inspection is a snapshot in time. Um, you're really responsible for making sure your device is, is safe and operating safely. And so we'll talk a bit about that more um, in the next slide. Can, uh, next, next slide, please. Thank you. So how did we develop the compliance standard? We use evidence and data uh, to identify the areas that, that most correlated to risk. And what this really meant on, I'll give you a, 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 a short, short version of how we did it. We looked at 10 years of both inspection and incident history. And we have some over 500 standard, what we call standard orders or standard non-compliances that we issue on a periodic inspection, say for elevators. And we looked at each one of those orders and then as associated inspection and in incident history. And then we put it through an algorithm whereby we looked at for that non-compliance, how many conditions would be needed to cause a failure. So if you need one condition to cause a failure, you can quite see how that would probably result in a high risk non-compliance versus needing two or three or four conditions to cause a failure. And also we looked at the mean time to that failure. So we actually assessed all of these uh, non-compliance and then there were over 500 in order to develop the compliance standard, uh, which again, the compliance standard are those high risk non-compliances where found on a periodic inspection, TSSA will be following up to ensure compliance. So this supports industry with understanding safety priorities and identifying what may pose a, public, a high risk to public safety if not immediately addressed. So we're also hoping um, regardless of where TSSA inspection is coming up, when, you, when a contractor or a certificate holder or mechanic sees this, he will address it promptly, right? It focuses owners, contractors, mechanics, and, and our inspectors on high risk non-compliances. And it also acknowledges that regulated parties have the primary responsibility for compliance and resolve what we call safety tasks. So those those non-compliances, which are considered low or medium risk non-compliances, we now refer to them as safety tasks. 
And if the uh, TSSA will not be following up on safety tasks on a periodic inspection. So we expect to, you to resolve those or correct those safety tasks at the time provided on the inspection report without TSSA having to come in and, um, and do a follow-up inspection. Compliance standards are dynamic, all right? And as you, you'll see from uh, when AJ uh, does some slides on, on how we changed the compliance standard and why we changed it, um, it is a dynamic dynamic. It will, it will change as we learn, as we get more mature, and they will be re reassessed on an ongoing basis. Next slide, please. So this is a pictorial view of, of how it works. So you have requirements which come from the regulations, the codes, director's orders, manufacturer bulletins. As I said, we have assessed them and, and they, they go into two really two buckets, high risk non-compliances and safety tasks, which are low and medium risk non-compliances. And those are translated into a compliance standard which lists all of the high risk non-compliances. And what's been built into our computer system for our inspector is an actual checklist. When our inspectors on this, on site, they were they are asked questions, and the answers to those questions will generate an inspection report, which will either have an inspection order or a safety task. And for orders, typically zero to fourteen day time to comply, and TSSA will be following up. Safety tasks, typically ninety days to comply, and TSSA will not be following up. Next slide, please. And if you can just go into the sample inspection report. And if you can make it a little bit bigger, perfect. So the top of the report is very similar to what you've seen before. And this report was um, 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 implemented on March 1st um, of this year. So the top of the report is the same. You have the inspection address, customer desk, the facility type, the device type, et cetera. And if you could just scroll down a little bit. And the next is our inspection notes, right? It says how we, where, we, where we have the authority to issue orders and where orders are issued. TSSA will be forwarding their uh, follow-up uh, inspection to confirm compliance. All right, you are expected to make all the necessary uh, corrections within the compliance time. Where safety tasks are, are issued, TSSA will not be performing a follow-up. You are still expected to make those corrections within the time allotted. TSSA will be implementing what we call a safety task audit program, um, where we will be auditing safety tasks uh, going forward. If you could just scroll down a little bit, please, and stop, uh, so go back up. Perfect. So at the top of the report, um, in, in previous, prior to March 1st, what we had was as the inspector issue orders, the orders would just come out uh, willy-nilly how, how, um, how he entered them into the system. So there was no specific um, order or, um, uh, or set to them. What we now have is inspection orders are at the top. Things that are that are zero to 14 day orders will be at the top. You will have the non-compliance, the code and the text clause, right? You will have the issue date and then the compliance date. And the compliance date will be the either uh, today's date, zero days or 14 days thereafter. And they're, they're ordered in their shortest time to comply to the longest. And if you can just scroll down to the next page, please. Perfect. And then they'll be followed by the safety task. Again, you'll have the code and text clause, right? The issue date and the compliance date. And typically the compliance date will be 90 days, but they will be ordered, if, they, if it's not 90 days, it will be ordered from the shortest compliance time to the longest. So thereby our inspection report is now uh, worked so that you can see what you need to do first, rather than prior to March 1st, it, it, with the inspection reports, you would have to go through them and sort that for yourselves. So we see that as a, as a good improvement. And at the bottom of the report, it's the same as before. You have the inspector name, their contact, and who the report was received by. So that's great. Next slide, please. And I'll hand it over to AJ. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I'm going to give a quick uh, update on the recent changes that we have made to the compliance standards. So TSSA may has made a change to the approach in determining the threshold of high risk orders. And the previous methodology that we used was based on what's called the land use planning standard. So they, we reviewed it. And uh, as you may know, last fall, uh, we came up with the new compliance standards but this compliance standards resulted in a high number of follow-ups, follow-up inspections and shutdowns. So this indicated a need for us to review the threshold 
and define a new approach. So since last year, we have reviewed it and we have come with the newer uh, updated compliance standards that was released on June 12th. Uh, next slide. So this graph uh, shows the new threshold for high risk orders. So looking at the orders issued in the last 10 years, uh, we identified, that is over the orders that was issued in the last 10 years, we identified 59 orders that uh, that captured 91% of the bad elevators that we have in Ontario. That means out of the orders that we have issued over the last uh, 10 years uh, and then different types of orders that we had, 59 orders, only 59 orders was sufficient to capture 91% of the bad elevators. As such, these 59 orders have uh, been updated as the high risk orders and this is our new compliance standard. So on the next slide, uh, Dean will walk you through the details of the compliance standards for elevators and escalators and show you um, uh, uh, what are the shutdowns and what are the safety tasks. Thank you. Thanks, AJ, and good morning, everyone. Um, so if we uh, click on the link up to the traction and then we'll just scroll down so uh, that's good. So the compliance standard starts off and it just uh, it gives you a little bit of understanding uh, as Sandra talked about. Um, and then there's also uh, uh, links to um, in red, you see compliance standards, what, why and benefits. So if you click on that link, it'll take you in and, and, and explain uh, what Sandra talked about of why why we have it and 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 how it'll benefit you. I, I did quickly look at some of the chats and some of the questions are, you know, if I have somebody um, taking care of my elevator already, an elevator company, do I have to, to, to be part of this? And the question, the answer is yes. Um, as the owner of the building, you're responsible. So when an inspector comes to your building to do a periodic inspection, they're they're going to be issuing the orders against the owner and it's your responsibility to make sure that those orders are complete. So as I've said in previous, uh, you know, when we're issuing these orders on, or when, when we're putting these orders on the compliance standards, these are kind of the showstoppers. We're giving you a heads up on, you know, if we issue this order or we find this order in non-compliance when, when we come to do our periodics, um, it could be a shutdown or it could be a, a short timeline to get it fixed. So it's important for owners to make sure that they're in compliance with these with these standards. Um, so it's 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 a first time TSA has done something like this, and it's it's really uh, and we're telling you upfront what are the things that that are high risk, right? So so what are the things that you want to make sure. Um, your elevators are full compliance with. So if we just scroll down a little bit more, that's good. So we do talk about incident reporting. Um, it's just a reminder um, to both the owners and the contractors out there that incidents have to be reported. Um, there's links, like I said, everything in red is a link. So there's links to guidelines reporting uh, Instance, there's links to incidents involving floods, and then there's actual links to the instant report forms. The report forms, um, you can, it's a simply type in PDF document that you can fill in and then email it to the address uh, on the top of the form. So if we just scroll up to important reminders, oh, go down a little bit. Sorry, go down to important reminders. Keep a little bit more. There we go. So device removed from service. This is just a reminder that, you know, if a device is removed from service, um, you, you have to talk with the inspector um, in order to uh, um, get it uh, returned to service. And if it is returned, if it's, it's removed from service and because of an unsafe condition, it's not to be returned until, so a mechanic shouldn't be turning it back on if it's still in that unsafe condition. Uh, maintenance control program it's been around for a while and this is just saying you know make sure you have uh, make sure you have your current maintenance control program and intervals are, are are in it and that it's up to date and it's a maintenance control work program for that specific device so if we just scroll yep that's good so so um 
the shutdown and repair and replacement. So this is what Sandra was talking about earlier. So when you see shutdown, that means the device will be removed from service. Um, and then when you see repair and replace, that means uh, a 14 day time period will be given to that order. So these are the checklists that, that Sandra talked about earlier. So when the inspector clicks on that, it'll say, you know, this device is shut down or this, this device will have 14 days to comply. Like, like Sandra said earlier, anything outside of that would be a safety task. So if we just scroll down to general requirements at the top, yep. So we just go in and we discuss <clears throat> um, the general requirements is just, you know, the owner contractor is not sure that any alteration of elevators completed by a registered contractor. Um, it, it is, uh, we do see this quite often where alterations um, get completed and they're not by a registered contractor. So it's just to make sure um, that you're aware of this um, and it would be a 14 day order. If, it, if that happened, uh, no person shall act as a contractor unless registered. Um, so that would be a shutdown. No person shall undertake take any work on an advice unless they're registered. Uh, no, no person shall construct, install, alter, repair, maintain, or test um, an element device. Um, and then no person shall operate an element device or cause the permit to operate in unsafe condition. If the device is ordered removed from service, TSA, it shall not be returned to service unless allowed by a TSA inspector. So, you know, you know, if we shut something down, even if the mechanic repairs it, um, that mechanic has to get approval from the from an inspector in order to return it to service. Um, and then if we just scroll down a little bit, that's good. So uh, just just go back up a little bit. I just want to cover that last topic. So the last one is if a seal is affixed, so if we seal the disconnect out, um, that seal cannot be removed by anyone unless unless an inspector gives permission to remove it. So it's a, uh, it's a reminder to everyone. So if we have sealed a device out, um, there's a reason for that. And, and the seal that gets put on the device says that it's not to be removed, but it's just a reminder to owners and contractors that uh, a seal shall not be removed unless the inspector gives permission to do so. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if we just scroll to owner at the top of the page there. So then we go through some owner's responsibilities. So if the director uh, is not notified within 10 days of the license information change, um, a 14 day order would be issued. If the license has expired, uh, if the maintenance control program logbook is not on site and readily available and being maintained up to date, data. Um, so those will all be 14 day orders. Um, now the next few are shut down or repair in place. So it really depends on, on the specific site and, and, and the situation. So, so it may be removed from service or it may be a 14 day order depending on the circumstances. So um, those are, if the keys to access the machine room control them are not kept on site, uh, if the means to access the machine room control room is damaged, um, if roof access is not properly hinged or counterbalanced, um, we do still have a lot of older elevators where you have to go up a ladder and go through a roof hatch. Uh, if the roof access ladder is not secure, if there is not means to safely enter the elevator, um, elevator pit, for example, there's no non-combustible ladder. So, you know, if the, if the, if there was, if it's an older device and the ladder was not provided and there's no other means to, to access the pit. Um, if we just scroll up and stop there. Yep. Yeah. So maintenance control program. So if the logbook on site is not specific to the device or log entries included are not applicable for components. So it's, it's really important that you know that the, the code stipulates that every device has to have an MC or the CAD story stipulates every device have to has to have an MCP, and that should be specific to that device on site. So there may be a, the contractor might have a general MCP document, but it's important that they, you know, strike out what is not applicable um, to that device, uh, and and just simply put a not applicable. Um, Machine room, control room. So now we get into um, the specific uh, areas. So um, the, the machine room, machine room, control room would be all 14-day orders. 
Um, if the machine room floor contains water, dirt, rubbish, oil, grease, uh, if articles are being stored, um, you know, these are not to be used as storage rooms. Um, it's, it's, it's a room for the elevating device equipment. So owners should not be using these to store Christmas stuff and paints and, and so forth. Uh, if it's the only stuff that should be in there are, are related to the actual elevating device. So if it's lubricants and that related, related to the device in order to, to maintain the device, that is fine, but it should only be stuff that's related to the LM device. Um, if the access door is not self-closing and self-locking, if the machine room, control room, or the hoistway is being used as a storage area, uh, if the main disconnect drive machine governor generator is not numbered properly, uh, if a minimum of one meter of clearance is not present around all electrical equipment that is uh, that has replaceable parts, uh, if the stairway is damaged and not safe and convenient. Okay, so if we just scroll up to motor gen machine generator, so we still do, we don't see a lot of them anymore, but we st still do have some jobs out there with generators. So it's just uh, if the generator brushes are worn. Um, brakes, brakes are a major thing on an LM device. It, it That's what holds you at the floor when the doors are open. Um, so you know, if the brake liners are impregnated with oil, the, the device would be removed from service. Um, if the brake lines are badly worn or damaged, um, if the brake drum is badly worn. Now these both say repair and replace. Um, they could be a shutdown depending on the situation at the site. Um, if it's a, if it's safe, um, but we, we do mention, and I should have mentioned at the beginning, at the beginning of the compliance center, we do mention that there are things that may not fall within the compliance center or be in the compliance standard, or there are situations where the inspector may be on site and just say, you know, it, it's 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 not safe. So we have to really remove this device from service. So it's just a reminder. Uh, ascending car over speed and uncontrolled car movement. Uh, so if the if device if this device is not being properly maintained. So if we just scroll up to controller, um, so contacts are worn on relays, uh, the governor, if the overspeed switch is not operative, drive shiv, if the machine shiv is worn or damaged, uh, we just scroll up to doors and gates at the top. Uh, so doors and gates, uh, if the normal reduced door closing time is shorter than is indicated on the door data tag, the device will be removed to service. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, hits by doors, and especially if they're Elderly, it, it could be um, could be life threatening, right? Uh, repair and replace if the Cat One test is not completed in accordance with the requirements of the code. Um, the door clutch is striking landing door pickup rollers stopping the car in flight. Uh, if the car or clutch is striking the landing door but not stopping the car, so that it's the two difference there. If you're stopping the actual car in flight, it would be removed from service and have to be repaired. And if it's not stopping the car, but it's it's clipping them. It would be a 14 day order to have it repaired. Um, if the distance between the car door and the landing door exceeds 140 millimeters on horizontal sliding doors. So if we just scroll up to the car door. So once again, this is one where it could be a repair in place or it could be a shutdown. Uh, if it's car door reopening device is not operative, it really depends on on, on the situation. Um, at site, um, but I mean, you wanna make sure your car door open device is, is operative. So uh, if the car door safety edge is operating intermittently or if the car door restrictor is not operative, both of those would be a, a shutdown order. Um, then we get to top of car. And if the top of car inspection station is not provided as per director's ruling, so it's important to, you know, every device has to have a top of car inspections station. So we'll go to landing. Uh, so if any hoistway access switch is not operative, if leveling uh, accuracy is not being maintained, if car leveling is not substantial level at all floors, and if stopping accuracy is, has not been maintained as per the requirements of 86416. <coughs> so we just scroll up to pit. So um, the repair in place if the counterweight run by has not been maintained. Um, um, shutdown or repair um, depends. And once again, this is the pit access ladder. If it's not secure, um, 
And then if pit access key is not group one security, it would be a 14 day order. Uh, the pit access door electric contact is not operative and the device would be shut down. And if the car safeties are not operative, the device would be shut down. Uh, and then we'll scroll up to inside of the car. So um, a 14 day order, if the emergency system alarm lighting communication ventilation have not been maintained according to 86.415 and uh, repair and replace uh, 14 day, sorry, if the car alarm and communication is not operative and a 14 day order, if the if a hole exists in the car station that would lead to accidental contact. And what we be, mean by that is, is accidental contact with uh, electrical components. So that is the traction. So if we go to the hydraulic elevators, I'm not going to go through all of the hydraulics because basically it's identical to the traction except for a couple of sections. Of course, we don't talk about brakes and on the hydraulics, but if we keep scrolling down, most of it is the same. And we just go a little bit more, keep scrolling down, there we go. So we have oil loss monitoring. So, so the device would move from service if for no reason was provided why oil was added or removed from the system. Um, and then it'd be a 14 day order if the oil loss monitoring is not being checked and recorded at each maintenance visit. So, I mean, oil loss monitoring is very important to monitor the oil because we do have a lot of cylinders out there that, that have uh, minimal protection. Um, and this is a way to uh, make sure that, that there's no holes in those cylinders and they're not leaking oil. So it is important that your contractor, um, if you have a hydraulic elevator that they, 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 they complete the oil loss monitoring program. And then if we just scroll down a little bit more, keep going to the hydraulic system. So, oh, oh. there we go. So hydraulic system. So if oil is missing in the system that cannot be accounted for. So the device would be removed from service. So it's important if we do have oil missing, um, we have to know what happened to it and where it went. So, um, and then if the low pressure switch has, been, has not been added to an inverted cylinder as per the ruling, so the ruling came back out in 2001 saying that if you have an inverted cylinder, a uh, low pressure switch had to be added. Um, I, I don't think there's too many out there that don't have them, but if, if one, say an elevator had been shut down for a amount of time and they wanted to return a service and it didn't have this, we'd expect them to, to put that on before returning it back to service. So, um, and that's the changes for hydraulic. Um, most of the rest is the same as, as the traction. And then we'll just go into escalators. So, so as, with escalators, we, we, we kind of did something a little different. Um, we, we split it into two compliance standards. We have one for the owners and one for the contractors. And the reason we did it that way is because there are things that the owner um, should watch for. And if they notice it, um, they should get a hold of their contractor to tell them to get in and repair it. So um, the beginning of the compliance standards is the same. We talk about what its purpose is and the benefits of it. And if we keep scrolling down, there's links to the regs. Um, and then we talk about incidents. Um, that's okay. Yeah, we talk about incidents and uh, we talk, we have the, the guidelines for, for escalator incidents and the incident report. For that. Um, like I said, everything in red are links. And then just important reminders, if we just scroll down to the important reminders. So it's just reminding everybody that, you know, you have to ensure you do your daily startup. As an owner, you have to make sure you do your daily startup. Uh, always ensure public safety by prohibiting access to escalators when performing inspections. Uh, signage, ensure reg required signs and data plates are not damaged or missing. And noises and vibrations. So report any unusual noises or vibrations to your maintaining contractor. <clears throat> um, make sure you, you know the, the mechanics certified uh, elevator license renewals and changes. So, or sorry, escalator license renewals. So make sure your 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 license renewal has been completed. And then alterations. It's just once again a reminder um, to to that alterations can only be when can only be done by a maintaining contractor or registered contractor and, and then a submission must be sent in uh, depending on the 
alteration, right? So if we go to escalator compliance standards, high risk items. So once again, it, it's the explanation of the shutdown and the repair replacement. So this is the same uh, as it was for the, as the traction and hydraulic elevators. So if we just scroll up some more. Um, so we have a checklist for, for escalators and it's just a quick checklist that the owners and contractors can use. Um, we will be completing a new checklist for elevators <laughs> because the compliance standards did change for the traction and the hydraulics. So we'll be creating new checklists and then we'll have that posted on our website. And if we just scroll down to, um, scroll down to high risk, yep. So we have a picture here we talk about all these things in the compliance standards and we thought we'd we didn't we put this pictogram in just pointing out what in case you know the owner is not sure what a skirt panel is or what a comb plate is or our landing entrance plate uh, handrail entry device so we we just point out uh, um, on the escalator that the, these certain things so we'll just go, scroll down oh Let's go to number one there. So, so the so general uh, verify that all required maintenance uh, tests are completed and indicated in the maintenance logbook. Uh, that can be accomplished by having your contractor send you electronic updates. Um, another way is you can have the mechanic when they're on site doing their maintenance just go over the logbook with you and make sure it's been completed. <coughs> Sorry. Operating emergency uh, stop buttons and stopping distances. So it's part of your daily check. So if any emergency stop buttons are inoperative, um, you should be uh, uh, shutting it down and contacting your contractor. The escalator stopping distance is not within the, the range stated on the daily stopping distance check sign. Um, so this is important because if you're not stopping within those ranges, that means you are you could have a brake failure. Um, so it is important that that you get a hold of your contractor right away and and you know barricade that thing off because you don't want people walking on it if the brakes did fail. Now, one of the things we did um, in and on the compliance center for the owners um, is we did include photos. Um, so we have the pictogram at the beginning, but we also have photos. So yeah, if we just click on that and we just show a, we'll just scroll down and we actually show a. Uh, we we give some verbiage, but we actually show a picture of, of a stop button. So something you might be looking for. Um, and it's just to help the owner uh, have a better understanding. So steps, if we scroll up or scroll down to steps. So steps, uh, um, if any steps are damaged or have missing components, um, so it'd be a shutdown and barricade it. So if we just click on the photo there, um, we show um, an example of you know a step with with uh, with sharp edges and aren't cracks, and then uh, and then we show a section of the step that's missing. Yeah. So if we just go back to comb plates, so if the comb plates are not in good condition or two adjacent teeth are missing, so it's important that. You know, um, we have had incidents where if you have um, more than two two or more teeth missing, uh, it creates a gap there and we've had shoes get caught. Um, so if we just click on the photo of that one, and then we just show where some teeth are. So pictures of where teeth are broken. And there's a, there's a, a photo there of where the teeth are broke off, right? Okay, so if we go back, Uh, so skirt panels and balustrades, if the panels are on either side of the escalators are worn, damaged, out of alignment or defective. Um, once again, we can click on the photo there and we just show some examples of, you know, where, where you're starting to get damaged, where on your, on your skirt panels, right? Um, this is important because we, uh, we do, we have incidents in the past where, um, um, feet get sucked in between the skirt and the step. So it's important that we we maintain that that uh, integrity of the skirt because the, the skirt has to um, meet uh, uh, 
it's third step index uh, standard. So by having that protective coating on the skirt, um, the skirts that have the Teflon coating, um, it helps comply with that third step skirt indexing. So it's important that we make sure those skirts are in, in good order. So if we just go back to the standard. Um, and we'll scroll up to handrails. Oh. We'll go to handrails, I think the number six. There we go. So handrails, if the handrail speed does not match the speed of the steps, um, could cause people to fail. And if there are cracks, pinching handers. So you got to remember the handrail bends. And so if you have cracks that run across it and, and, and somebody's hands there, it could close and pinch their hands. So if you notice that, it's important that you, uh, you shut it down and get a hold of your contractor. Uh, guarding if any ceiling intersection guards are not in place. So that would be a, we did, we, if we found that we would issue a 14 day order on that, but uh, barricades, if the outer deck barricades are not uh, secured or in place, and we show some photos of that. And the last one is landing. So if the, any lighting that is part of the escalator is not in good working condition, or if any, if any ambient lighting is inadequate, uh, if there is any obstacles or slip and trip hazards on the landings and we do show some photos of that I'm at the bottom if you just scroll down a little bit more we do have clips to our uh, uh our, some safety videos we put together um you know it's a you it goes it takes you to a youtube site and you can watch the videos um they're great safe videos so if you want to you know use them at a, at a safety uh safety meeting uh, or if you want to you know we always set tsa starter meetings off with a safety moment so they're great great safety videos to be used for that so if we go back to um, yeah, escalator contractors and just scroll down a bit so once again this is the same um, it just goes through the benefits and all the links in red you keep scrolling down um, this is the same with the incident reporting, keep going. And then once again, we talk about what is a shutdown and what is a 14 day. So that's the same, all this is the same throughout the compliance standards of the devices. And there's our checklist um, for uh, contractors checklist. And if we keep going down. And so we have a, a pictogram here um, and then we have some more detailed things. Um, so at the time, um, industry thought it'd be a good idea to, to put it in as well for this. So we just have a little bit more detailed where the owner wouldn't see a lot of this stuff, but the contractor would. So there's a, like, like you see at the top, the break and stuff like that. So if we keep scrolling down. So we talk about uh, general, if the license is expired, um, you know, it'd be a 14 day order. Stop switches, if any machinery space stop switch is on operator, if any emergency stops button is inoperative, the device would be removed from service until that's been repaired. Controller, if any electrical protect device is inoperative, so any EPD, um, if there are defects in the controller's wiring, if any controller wires are not properly inserted into terminal blocks, if any bare live wire is not guarded against contact, or if there's debris in the controller cabinet itself. So those would be 14 day orders. Um, breaks, uh, if the brake data tag is not posted or legible, um, if the brake adjustment procedure is not posted or does not contain detailed instructions for setting the brakes, it's really important. The mechanics need that information in order to, to set up the brakes properly. Um, and then we talk about the brake maintenance according to 8682. So, you know, um, and maintenance completed on the brakes and the following have discovered damage or not operating properly. So it talks about pins, levers, springs, um, sleeves. Oh, wait, just go down a little bit. Sorry, right there. Yep. Um, if the manufacturer's specific maintenance has not been performed, so a 14 day order. If the dry machine break test demonstrated non-compliance and is not documented in the logbook. So we'd expect that 
you know, they would do the maintenance and, and log it saying that the device is in compliance. So if we just scroll up to in accordance with, yeah. Um, and then we get into um, the, the testing. So 868.15.4. So the driving brake torque exceeds the maximum torque indicated in the brake data tag. The no load down stopping distance is more than the maximum stated on the brake data tag. Uh, for escalators using dynamic braking, it's it's something that's new and, and in the code now. Uh, written test procedure shall be posted. And if the deceleration and or stopping distance did not comply with the posted requirements, then it would be removed from service. And then this is just a reminder for Montgomery, uh, Montgomery escalators with DC shoe type brakes uh, of the safety alert. Um, so once again, if you click on that, it'll take you to it. Um, but it's just a reminder of those requirements if you have that type of brake. Um, and then we get into escalator speed monitoring device, uh, speed governor reversal stop device. So the escalator speed monitoring device, uh, speed governor reversal stop device is inoperative. So um, we would shut that down until it was repaired. Drive chain device, the broken drive chain device is not operative. Um, broken step chain device, if the broken step chain device is, or the tension carriage does not uh, have free motion. Steps, if any of the steps are cracked, dented, have sharp edges, damaged risers, improper engagement, broken treads or non-compliance with widths and depth slots. Um, we would remove that from service. Um, and then we get into the maintenance of, of the steps annual maintenance. So if the step thrust device, the missing step device or the step level device are not an, are an operative, um, the device would be shut down. Um, and then if the step step change trusses have structural defects, a buildup of combustible material are not in good mechanical condition. Uh, if the clearance between successive steps is more than six millimeters. So those two would be uh, 14 day orders. And we get into the skirt panels and skirt obstruction devices. So uh, if the balustrades are damaged, if the balustrade fasteners have burrs or snag points, um, they would be uh, 14 days to, to get those completed. And, it, and if the gap between the the balustrade exceeds more than five millimeters. The device would be removed in service until they're adjusted. And then it talks about annual maintenance. Um, if the skirt obstruction device is improperly adjusted or, or inoperative, the step skirt gap exceeds the requirement tolerance in table one. And if the SSBI test results in the log book do not comply with available to tolerances in table one. So we put this, uh, this table in and it just talks about um, um, if you have, depending on when the device was installed, so the year the code, the, the year of the code that applied to it, it talked about. It talks about if your device has skirt deflectors or or, or does not have skirt deflectors, which are um, a lot of people call them brushes. You'll see them on the side escalators if they have brushes. So look, the 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 tolerances are different if you do have those brushes, um, and then talks about the skirt. Uh, step clearance gap, depending on what code your device fell under. Um, there's different requirements on those code sections. So this just, this was put in to help mechanics as well. Um, so they can quickly look at it and say, okay, this device was installed in 1960. So I need, I know this is the requirements that it has to meet. Um, and then we go to comb plates and we talk about um, if all the comb sections are not properly mounted or cracked and have broken teeth, the comb plate teeth are not good condition. Um, if the combs do not mesh with the slots and the steps, so it's important because they'll grab onto shoes, especially little shoes. Um, and then it gets into uh, uh, the maintenance control program, the annual maintenance. So if the comb impact device has not been tripped and shut down the unit, uh, um, if the uh, if the activation of the comb impact it does not have a manual reset type, um, and then we get into comb plate forces. So once again, there's a table put in to help a mechanic. Depending on when the unit was installed, the code had changed. So there is uh, um, different force requirements, and it's just to help them to to it's a quick check for them. 
So then we get into landing entrances and egresses. So this is your upper and lower. The upper and lower landing plates have tripping hazards or are not maintained, provided with firm foothold. We do see after time, some of them get, get wore out and they get smooth and then they get slippery, right? Uh, if the landing plates are not secured in place as per design, and if the entrance and exit with the safety zone are obstructed. So the safety zone is the entrance. That's the area when you're coming off and getting onto the escalator. And sometimes, especially on Christmas time, we get some of the stores that they start piling stuff around the escalator. So it makes it hard, harder to get on and off them. Um, so we just want to make sure that those, those areas are, are kept clear. Uh, handrails in accordance with the MCP requirements if the handrails are damaged or cracked. Uh, if the handrails have pinch hazards, the handrail speed does not match the speed of the step. Uh, and if the hand or finger guards, uh, handrail entries are damaged. Uh, and then we get into the to the annual maintenance element. So if the handrail entry device is not operative or is inoperative, or if either the handrail speed monitoring device or the stop handrail device are not are inoperative. Then we get into deck barricades. So if the outer deck barricades are not in place or they're damaged, um, guarding, if the ceiling guards are not in place or damaged. And then once again, we get into our, our safety videos. So that is the compliance standards. Uh, I know it's a lot of, lot of talking, a lot of information, but uh, it's just a guide to help you. And then uh, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Sandra. Dean, I think it might be um, um, good just for the, um, uh, the escalator contractors to open up the checklist. So if you could open up that again, Patrick, the compliance standard for escalator contractors. <clears throat> so if you just go to the escalator contractors link and just click on that. Yeah. Yep, just click on that. And then if okay. you scroll down. Okay, there. Stop right there. And if you click on the red. Yep. You might have to make it a little bigger. Yeah, if we can make it a little bigger for everybody. Yep, and just scroll down. And then we'll just scroll down and it, it takes you through, keep going. So that's just the same thing we're taught. So it's stopped there. So it just takes you through and it gives you a quick uh, checklist on what a repair or replace or what a shutdown would be. And it goes through the same steps as the compliance standard does and the so same bullets. So we will be doing this for traction and hydraulic elevators as well. It's just a quick handy reference for the mechanics to have on site. Yep. Okay, perfect. I think that we can go to the Q and A's now. Uh, so um, we have about 13 or 14 questions. Um, Oh, let's go in order. It doesn't seem I, there doesn't seem to be many upvotes, so I'll just go. We have seen consultants inspecting elevators on behalf of TSSA and issuing reports on TSSA letterhead. How does TSSA keep inspection orders neutral in this manner? Um, we during the strike we have hired consultants um, to help us keep up with the very base load that we had to do as an essential, as an essential service. Uh, we still have uh, contracts ongoing with them. I don't, and um, and so they they actually are appointed as inspectors and are doing inspections for us. Um, AJ, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yes. Uh, um, so just to make it very clear, yes, we are using contractors because uh, we are short of capacity, but we, they do have very clear uh, instructions on the conflict of any interest that they may have. So. They are not allowed to inspect, or mostly it's periodic inspections, uh, any site or customer they have worked with before, or there might be any sort of conflict. And uh, we monitor that uh, very closely. And the capacity we use is very small. It's just that we are trying to catch up with our demand right now. Uh, the next question is TSSA working on providing a directory for licensed contractors on in its website. Um, um, AJ, I'll let you take that, but um, a tech, I, I think, uh, Dean, correct me if I'm uh, wrong, but I think uh, we don't have a list on the uh, website, but if a customer wants to find out, uh, they can find out through our public information uh, department. Yeah, and, and um, I mean, we are in the midst of, uh, AJ, you might want to mention, we are in the midst of updating our website as well to make it more, yeah. so we will, we will have um, better options in the future, I guess. 
And I think uh, I know um, I, I know from the field's perspective, we're looking at it, putting our certificate holders on our website. So I think it is something that TSSA is going to do, putting a listing of all of our contractors, et cetera, so that people can find out whether the contractor they're using is properly registered or their mechanic is, uh, is properly certified by TSSA. Um, an elevator installed in 2009. We've had minor issues over the years, but I've dealt with them immediately. Is there any, any timeline as to when an elevator has to be replaced due to age of the machine? So there's no specific timeline. It doesn't say that an elevator has to be replaced any, every 10 years. Um, I mean, I always compare it to a car though. I mean, even if you do great maintenance on a car, eventually you're gonna have it where it's just not up to par anymore. So I think it's, uh, it's important that owners um, watch that. We do see where, you know, if it's in commercial buildings um, and there's a lot more busyness to the building or condos that maybe have only two elevators, they, they are a lot busier. So they tend to wear out quicker. So I think it, there's no timeline, but I think it's important that, you know, they're gonna eventually start costing you a lot of money. So I guess you can monitor it that way. If our elevators are maintained regularly by Otis, do we need to participate in this type of presentation or, or is Otis responsible for keeping us up the code? You're, you're responsible um, for, the, for the compliance of your elevator. Um, uh, I mean, you, you hire your contractor, but you as the owner operator are responsible for it. Dean, I don't know if you want to chime in on this. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's important though. I think it's important that you, you participate in the compliance standards because like I said earlier, these are your showstoppers. So these are, that you want to make sure that you're in compliance with these so that you should be talking to your contractors saying, you know, are all these things in compliance? Because if TSA comes in to do a periodic, I don't want to be shut down for something like this. So so I think it is a big, big something that you want to be part of and, and you want to make sure that these things, these are the high risk items that we're pointing out. So you want to make sure you're in compliance and you don't have any of these items. And Dean, just to add to that, uh, you're not required to participate, but uh, it's uh, like Dean said, uh, it's very good to know the new compliance standards because we have reduced the number of high risk orders. But if we find non compliance, we are going to shut it down. Uh, that's part of the reason we have a few number of compliance standards, but we are only going after the ones that are high risk. So to know about it and to talk to your contractor is very important. But as an owner operator, you, you ultimately are the one who are responsible for your elevator being in compliance, right? Um, what is your recommendation on an elevator consultant? Is there a required designation? My understanding is that, yes, you, you are required to be registered as an elevator consultant contractor. Is that not correct, Dean? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. They are, they are, there is a classification for consultants. How are changes to the compliance standard being communicated? Well, this is one of the communication venues. Uh, we're certainly going to post this live. The compliance standards have been updated and they're, they are on our website. Our inspectors have been, you know, been um, uh, are going to be given um, uh, wallet cards to give, to, uh, give when they're on inspections, gives, gives you a direct link and a, a QR code to the compliance standards. And, um, and I, I believe that we're going to be putting it in our electronic newsletter and sending it out to e-subscribers e as well. So um, that's our plan. And th this webinar is certainly one of the first steps in communicating uh, these changes out to the, uh, to, the, to the elevator industry. We have a company that maintains and inspects our elevator monthly under service contract and completes any work that is highlighted during those inspections. Do I still need to be part of this presentation? Um, I think this has been answered before. I think it's really important as an owner operator that you are engaged and that you do understand, which is very important. So I do think it's really important that you do participate. I'm a trustee in a church which has a lift. Are lifts considered elevators? Um, I believe that they are, but uh, Dean, I'll let you answer that question. So, so uh, uh, a device for a person with physical disability is an elevating device, not necessarily an elevator. Um, so these compliance standards are put together for traction elevators and hydraulic elevators, but not necessarily a device that falls under the B355 code, which is the uh, code for persons with physical disabilities. So, so um, yeah, they're not, these compliance, we're not putting, we, we may be putting, we will be putting, sorry, other compliance standards out in the future for, for 
for like B35 high devices, but at this point, we're just working on devices um, ele like passenger elevators and both traction hydraulic. Uh, can you explain the change to the monthly inspection on firefighters emergency operation? We have an elevator that you need to hold the button to move between floors. I'm not sure if this checklist is, uh, is for our type of elevator. I think so, this is a little beyond this this webinar, but go ahead, Dean. So, so the the code did change to 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 stipulate that there are monthly checks to do uh, on on elevator on elevators um, when it came to FEO, um, and it's it's doesn't say like it it says it has to be done once a month just to make to to a minimum. There's only minimum things that have to be completed. Um, if you could reach out to me um, and it does depend on the, the vintage of your elevator. I could look into it a little further. Um, um, if you, if I don't know, it's a, a link to the person's email address or, you know, if you, if you could reach out to me, um, then we can talk about this further and, and discuss it. Cause it may be just the fact that you have an older vintage elevator. How are we supposed to get someone out to an elevator when a technician is unavailable for an extended period of time? Um, I think this is, especially for COVID and everything else, I think all industries are, are experiencing this. Um, uh, I, I don't know exactly how to answer this question because I know there's a sort of labor everywhere. Um, I don't know, Dean or AJ, if you want to um, try to answer this, but I don't know that we have a specific answer. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's reasonable that you know, most contractors, you know, depending on where it is, are 45 minutes to an hour to, to, to get to the site to get somebody out of a trapped elevator. But, I mean, you can call the fire departments, right? They do have, um, a lot of fire departments have taken training on how to do this, and, and so they are aware, but they do, you know, if there's a medical situation and you have to get them out right away and the contractor can't get there, I um, encourage you to call the fire department. Perfect. When an inspector shuts down an elevator, what is the timeline for them to re-inspect? I've had an order completed in the same day, but we had to wait three days for them to come back to site and release the elevator. I, I think, uh, Sandra, we, we try to respond as fast as possible at, you know, for shutdowns. But uh, uh, again, we also have capacity constraints. So that's, uh, you know, uh, about two to three days is kind of the timeline that we are looking at right now. But, but once again, we are telling everybody what the showstoppers are and, and we're telling the contractors and we're telling the owners. So hopefully that will eliminate that from happening because you know ahead of time if they come in and they find this stuff, it'll be shut down. So, so that's the whole purpose of the compliance centers is to make everybody, all the parties aware uh, in hopes that uh, we, can, we can get away from that. That, that situation that they would have that stuff corrected so the inspector wouldn't find that stuff when they're on site. Yeah, and, and the real hope is that um, in between TSSA inspections that these things are corrected, that you don't have to wait for TSSA inspector to show up, that, you know, if your inspection's not due for a couple of years and you find these things, that you deal with them right away, right? Because these are, are as being say, uh, showstoppers. Have there been any changes to compliance standards in regards to construction and hoist, specifically to what proof of training the operator requires? We have not done a compliance standard for construction hoist. We've only done it for escalators, uh, traction elevators, and hydraulic elevators. Um, I don't think there would have been any, uh, uh, um, uh, any changes, but Dean, maybe you can take that on? Yeah, we have not put together a compliance standard for, for construction hoist. So I, 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 I believe it's on in the future, but I, I can't even remember when we said we were going to try to have that done by. But okay. at this point, we don't have one. Yeah, we don't have a compliance standard. We just have it for hydraulic and traction elevators. Does the inspector have access to digital digital MCP logbooks provided through the contractor for the site? And I'll uh, turn so it over to D. Yeah, so electronic logbooks are allowed by the code. Um, what it does say is it says that the if you do have electronic code books, you have to have means on site so the so the um, inspector could access them. So it would be, you know, I don't know if you, it would be a QR code or of some type of PC system on site that they could access those. Uh, so can they, you? So they are. Sorry, allowed. go ahead. Sorry. So sorry, Sandra, but they are allowed according yeah. to code. Um, 
For an expired license, would this apply as an immediate shutdown? Um, no, on the compliance standard, uh, an expired license is a 14-day order. Um, where it would be, a, it would be a shutdown is you if you entered the lapsed authorization process, and that um, would, would that, that triggers a job to be created, which is called lapsed authorization, 60 days after the license expires. TSSA, we reach out to you from head office um, uh, um, at least twice before we show up at site. But if we end up dispatching an inspector after you've been contacted um, 60 days prior to your license expiring, at expiry, and then you're contacted 60 days after uh, license expires, and then you're contacted by our inspector before he goes to site. When we arrive at site at that point, we will shut you down. But if we go there on a periodic inspection, we're going to be issuing a 14-day order. What is the time frame for an inspector to re-inspect or get permission to release a car after repair has been made? In the past, I've also had difficulty reaching inspectors, supervisors, and elevators that have been shut down for days and even after repair has been made. I think AJ has answered that question. Um, we, we do try to put shutdowns as a high priority um, and, um, and, and try to get our inspectors out there as, as fast as possible. But we, like you, have uh, labor constraints, and I, AJ, I don't know if you want to. Um, yeah, say just to else. add to that, uh, you know, the you should contact the workforce planning team directly, not the inspectors, and uh, they will be able to find another inspector uh, if uh, the previous inspector is not available. So the fastest and best way is contact workforce planning, and uh, as soon as you can, uh, so that we can schedule a, an inspector to come there. And we do okay. prioritize shutdowns. We do prioritize shutdowns. So, okay. And AJ's right. Um, it used to be you used, used to contact the inspector. Now you need to contact head office because we actually have a department that books our inspectors and schedules them. Right. And if one uh, inspector is not available, we'll be able to find other inspectors who can come over. That's correct. Uh, can you quickly share with us examples of what is considered an incident, uh, and when we as owners need to complete the the incident reporting form? So, Dean, I'll hand that over to you. So, I, I think um, if you go to the guidelines um, of incidents, it walks you through and it makes it very clear in the guidelines uh, um, what is a reportable incident. Um, so, it, it's important that uh, um, you, you just take a look at those guidelines. They're, they're Rob Kramer and myself had spent a lot of time on them, and they're very informative and it gives examples and all that. So, so it'll walk you through on 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 a reporting incidents and yes both owners and contractors are responsible for reporting incidents so and so it's, it, it's in the guidelines as well it talks about them so when you go on our website and i know um in the <clears throat> chat there's been links to the compliance standards um if you go on our if you go in the compliance standards you will find um right at the top uh, after we explain you know what a, what a compliance standard is that has a link for that then it has a link to the guidelines for reporting incidents and that's where you can find that and if you go on our website, if you go to elevating devices down the left-hand side, you'll, you'll find the compliance standards. They're very, they're very easy to find. And as well as on our website, you'll see um, when you go to our website, it's the top right corner. You'll see report an incident, and then it walks you through if it's an elevator or, or a fuel. And uh, you just the clinks, and it takes you right to the, the forms and the guidelines. Uh, can you confirm an elevator license must be posted in elevators? I, I believe the answer is yes, with the exception that you can get permission to post it el elsewhere uh, from the director. And maybe Dean, you can um, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it's a, it's um, it's an alteration if you want to move the license, and, and the director has the power to sign off on that and allow that. So they do not have to go. It, they have to be posted unless you get permission. So you just can't take them out and put them somewhere else. You actually have to to get permission to do that. Do you have a do you have a contractor registry online? I believe we've answered this question. We're going to be. Um, um, uh, I, I think that our intent is to have a contractor registry online. Where can we find the fifty nine orders which are stated to having more than ninety? percent of the issue on elevators. Um, the compliance standard um, is a um, plain language uh, um, document of the 59 orders themselves. So that that, that is the um, the orders. They, some of those some of those elements may represent one or two orders, but those are the plain language um, um, representation of the 59 orders. 
I don't and know. Sir, the... I can just add to that, it's not all the elevator, 91% of the issues on the elevators. It's not a chain of the accumulated risk. So yeah. what we looked at is that these 59 orders, if you looked at their risk rank and how often they're issued, they represent 91% of the risk of, of um, uh, associated with elevators. The high risk associated with elevators, yeah. right? Yeah. But the, and these 959 does not capture all the elevator issues. It doesn't capture 91% of the elevator issues, only the high risk items. That's correct. What is the need for a consultant when TSSA is doing important inspections? I, I think that it's a choice that as an owner you, you have, right? So um, it, it's up to you. I don't think we can really say anything else on it other than as an owner, you have a choice, right? That's correct. Uh, current TSSA timeline for all its provided services is not sustainable and contractors and customers are negatively impacted considering the current economic situation. What is TSS doing to address this important issue? So I think uh, on this one, we need a little bit more clarity. I think uh, we are responding to any customer driven work as a priority. I don't think that I need major delays there. It's more the periodics that have been a little bit behind. But most customer driven uh, activities driven, uh, you know, we take it as a priority. So I think we are responding quite fast right now. Uh, if there's any issue, please contact uh, workforce planning. And uh, if it doesn't happen, then you can escalate it to me or you. Um, also, I also think um, you should mention, AJ, that you are hiring a number of inspectors yep. Uh, yep. currently, right? To increase our, um, our um, uh, our workforce. Yep. And, and but the important thing, uh, Sandra, is our priority is given to customer driven work. So that gets uh, before we get there to periodic inspection. So, do you need permission from TSSA to put licenses in the penthouse elevator machine room? And the answer is yes. Um, I, do you uh, do you, uh, yes, you need permission from the director if you don't want to post the license in the um, in the actual car. To confirm the director of apartment building can give permission to have the elevator license somewhere else. No, uh, the director it would be the director of the elevating device program. It would be AJ, um, one of the presenters on this call would be the person that would have to give that permission. And sorry if we didn't make that clear. It's not, it's, it's the director, it's the statutory director of the program that needs to give that, that permission to post the elevator license elsewhere. Yeah, it's the director per the regulations, which in, in for for Ellen devices is AJ. And I think um, I think there are a few comments, Sandra, on the chat. Uh, yeah. Not able to got captured on the. Uh, um, what would prevent the license from being posted elsewhere? Um, uh, the, the, there's nothing preventing it as long as you get permission from the director. Um, one of the things that, you know, I get calls on um, is that, you know, why isn't the license posted in the elevator? People think the elevator is not licensed when it's, when the, when, it's, when, the uh, when the license is not posted in the car. So, um, so that's why you would need um, permission from the director. So in the chat. Can you direct us to where log book for in-house checks on elevators? I'm looking to understand what we need our staff to do is above what the monthly inspection covers. Do you want me to repeat that? Can you direct us to where the log book for in-house checks on elevators? I am looking to understand what we need our staff to do. I guess not their mechanics, but their staff to do what is above what the monthly inspection covers. So, so there is a daily inspection checklist that um, it's been in place for a long time. Um, I'm sure you already have that. Um, but our, our expectation for the compliance standard isn't to to um, give you anything extra. It's just to make you aware that you know if you're. It's to make some more clarity because your daily inspection should also say you know if you have more than two teeth missing on your comb plate to, to call your contractor right away, shut it down, call your contractor, but it's just a nut. The compliance center is just another uh, tool um, with visuals to, to help those people complete that. 
check. Hey, Dean, I think a question was uh, not on the es uh, escalators, more the elevators, the logbook. Where is the logbook? Oh, the logbook. So the logbook would be located in the machine room. Um, and, and like I said, you can you can ask your contractor. I encourage owners when your contractors in do maintenance to, to go over the logbook with them. So there's another uh, question in the chat. Do contractors have to report back to TSSA on safety tasks corrected? Or is this process internal to the maintenance contractor? So currently right now, you do not have to report back to us whether or not you completed the safety task. What TSSA is looking at in, in, in a future enhancement to our portal system is that, you know, when you log on to renew your license, that you can tick off that you've corrected these safety tasks. So we know that when you do your annual license uh, renewal that you've done that, that is not yet in place. Uh, but so for today, um, there is no requirement to report back to us on safety tasks. Um, however, we will be um, uh, implementing an audit program um, so we will be doing some audits and make, to see if safety tasks are actually being complied with. I think, uh, will there be a PFD, uh, PDF summary of the slides showing the compliance standards available to us? There will be a recording posted on our website and we can attach, attach a PDF um, the PDF of the slides to that, or there will be the, the, the uh, slides will be in that. I understand we should speak to our co elevator contractor, but we but also feel they are hired to do the job. Or, some, or should come to us as well as we are busy property managers and have other items to do. Our schedules don't always match up. Feel like we can we can't always depend on them. Um, in the end, as an owner operated property manager, you are responsible for the um, the compliance of your elevator. I know that you hire contractors, but ultimately orders are going to be issued to you to bring things into compliance. I don't know, Dean or AJ, if you want to um, um, add on to that. Yeah, and maybe if you if you're not uh, if you're not you know it's hard to meet up with a mechanic on site. You can almost touch base with the office and just get an update on on where you stand with the compliance centers and where you stand with your maintenance um, if everything's been completed. Can you please send a link for FEO testing? I don't know that we necessarily have a link for that, Dean. Um, yeah, there's some stuff on our website. I'm um, not sure how to send the link, but I can look. I can get the link in, and maybe we can include it in in the presentation somehow. Okay, I see. There's more questions in the Q and A. Is it up to our due diligence to renew the license or does somebody notify us? So I can take that on. Um, you are notified uh, by us. You're, send, you're sent an invoice for your license renewal 60 days prior to its expiry. You're sent a notification now um, upon expiry. And then we, we reach out to you 60 days after expiry. But um, um, it is your, it's your license, right? Um, it's, it's your requirement to um, make sure that it's in good standing and that it's renewed on time. So ultimately, we do send out reminders, but it's your responsibility to make sure that your elevator is licensed and, and is in good standing. Uh, Sandra, might be a good time to also inform the team about the lapsed authorization process if they have not renewed it. I did touch on that during um, my slides, but I'll just do a, a quick overview. Uh, two years ago, we introduced a lapsed authorization program, and an, an authorization is the license for your elevator. And so um, if you do not renew your license uh, 60 days after expiry of it, we will, uh, we will uh, create a job in our system. Um, head office will reach out to you and, and say, hey, you haven't renewed your license, you need to do so. Um, and if you, don't, if you don't respond to that, then an inspector will contact you. And then, then um, they will reach out to you by phone 
And then uh, ultimately, if you don't respond to that, an inspector will um, go to site and shut down the device if you, if, if you haven't responded to our multiple attempts to get you to renew the license. So that's an ongoing program. Uh, we've have about 95% um, success rate on it. Um, so um, it's a program that will be ongoing at TSSA. And in order to avoid additional costs, it's best to renew it before we start contacting them after yeah. it's over. Yeah, there's there's costs associated with this program, and um, and so um, it's best to renew it. But plus, you know, if you don't renew your license, an inspector ends up being dispatched to site because you have not renewed your license. You're going to incur a shutdown, which is costly and inconvenient, and everything else, right? Uh, how do we know if permission has been granted from the director previously to one's employment? I, I take it this is for posting the license uh, somewhere else. Um, um, I, I would assume that there's going to be a, a, a specific record of that permission that's been given by the director. So um, yeah, when the permission's given, Sandra, it's, it it stipulates that that permission has to be posted in the machine room. So they, they you should see the posting of the machine room or the permission. So the inspector would know as well when they go into the machine room that that permission was given. Can the given deadline to complete a repair be extended? And, and the answer is yes. Um, we would want good reason, but yes, uh, we we we, um, we we we're not um, we are reasonable. Um, but we do expect that we, now we've published the compliance standard that you know you know what things are going to cause a shutdown or a 14 day order. So please have them re have them addressed long before TSSA shows up for a periodic inspection. And also, just to emphasize, Sandra, once if it's a shutdown, we are going to shut it down, right? That part we don't. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, shut shutdown is a shutdown. I yeah. mean, um, um, are owners allowed in the machinery room unescorted by the technician? Um, Dean, I think the answer. I think I've heard the answer to this many times, but yeah. Uh, so, so, the, so the owner can go in the machine room. It's uh, it's not. Uh, they don't have to have the elevator technician. Um, but I do encourage that. You know, it, it, there's moving stuff in there, so just be very careful um, when you're in there. But yes, you do. You are the owner. You, you can, um, but you're not allowed to touch things, and you're not allowed to adjust things, and you're not. But I just, I encourage that you be very careful when you you go in there because there are moving components and that. So I don't want to see something get hurt. And the, Dean, and the room has to be locked, right? Only only yes. quality. The, the, the door has to be self-closing and self-locking. Yes. And only qualified individuals should be allowed in because it's a dangerous place to be. Yeah. Um, this question we've answered before: Do contractors have to report back on safety tasks? Uh, right now, no. Uh, you don't have to report back to TSSA on safety tasks. Um, what we're looking forward to in the future, um, we're going to enhance our portal so that when you re when you renew your license, you can uh, check off that you've actually done that. But that's not in process yet. Uh, so right now, no, you don't have to report back to us on whether safety tasks have been completed. TSSA is going to be instituting a safety task audit program. And so we're, so we can collect data on the uh, compliance rate for that. So I see no more questions, um, but I would like to um, uh, thank AJ and Dean and, I look, and specifically thank um, the people that participated today. Um, I think this was a um, really good uh, uh, vehicle of communication. This is our third webinar. And I just want to say thank you very much to everybody who, um, who attended today. And, um, and, and, if you're, and, and this webinar will be posted. It's recorded and it will be posted on our website. And I encourage you to let other people know to, um, to uh, um, download it and listen to it if they uh, feel it might be useful for them. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.